could sink it, the water would be lost forever below the waves of Lake Tinsu. But there was one aspect of the plan the Norwegians balked at, the possibility of taking innocent lives by bombing a passenger ferry. We had had quite a lot of um, telegrams going back and forth from England about this. I know for certain that it was taken up in a Norwegian cabinet meeting. And uh, the order was to sink it at any cost. If innocent lives were going to be taken, the saboteurs had to make absolutely certain that the water would be lost to the Germans forever. They had to sink the ferry in the deepest part of the lake so there could be no chance of a salvage operation, and those lives wouldn't have been lost in vain. When the ferry has been underway for one hour and ten minutes, it comes to a place on Lake Tinsjö, which is 400 meters deep. But there are fishermen on the water, so there would be a possibility of those passengers who were in the water to be saved. One problem the saboteurs faced was that the heavy water itself was closely guarded as it moved from the plant to the lake. It would spend the night at a siding before being loaded onto the ferry, but again that would be swarming with guards. With each attack the Germans uh, increased their, their surveillance and I think by the time of the attempt to move the, 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 the stocks of heavy water I think it's a couple of SS companies involved. So crucial was the heavy water to the Nazi war effort that those SS companies were under the personal supervision of General Nicholas von Falkenhorst, the commander of German forces in Norway. Falkenhorst told the commander at Rukan that when you are ordered to guard anything as precious as this, as a goal, as a chest of gold, sit on it. Don't walk around it and guard it from the outside. Sit on the chest. And that's what the Germans and the German commander did. He, he put a lot of German soldiers and sat on the transport itself during the whole night. But he did not watch the ferry at all during the night. We knew there was a trapdoor from one of the cabins down to the hull of the ship. The two others were to go down the trapdoor and I would guard the top. I sat on the mountainside and followed all the activities. Uh, the train came at nine with all the passengers and I wandered down to have a look. The whistle blew at nearly 10 and I disappeared. About 10.30, I was on the bridge then at that time and I heard a, uh, what do you call, explosion down in the ship. The ship started to went over to the port side. Then I jumped in the water and I swim for about 15 feet from the ship and I go around and look at the ship and then she went down. Several civilians were picked up by local fishermen but 14 Norwegians died, along with four German guards. As for the heavy water, well, it's still down there. In April 1945, after the German surrender, their atomic plant was found hidden in a Bavarian village. It was short of the 700 litres of heavy water needed to go critical, the first phase in making a bomb. Almost exactly the amount which had been destroyed when the ferry was sunk. Today, opinion is divided as to whether the Nazis could actually have produced an atomic bomb. But in the light of what was known at the time, there really isn't an issue. Whether the Germans were a month, a year, two years away, whether German scientists were sufficiently 
morally strong that they would never put a bomb in the hands of Hitler is almost irrelevant. The essential thing to remember is at the time the Allies feared, suspected and had good grounds to fear and suspect that the Germans were embarked on a race for a, an atomic bomb. What's amazing is that while 91 soldiers and civilians died in the various attempts to destroy the heavy water, all the members of Operation Grouse and Gunnerside survived not only the attack on the plant, but also the rest of the war. All lived into old age, and five, including the leader, Joachim Ronneberg, returned to Vermorck for the 60th anniversary, standing now on the very spot they risked their lives to reach then. Seems very peaceful now. It is very peaceful. As it was peaceful when, when we came to we spoke to peace, all right. Yeah. <laughs> the, the year sort of disappears between it as if it was yesterday. Only when you look at your friends, you see that it, it couldn't have been yesterday. The success of the operation uh, reverberated throughout Whitehall uh, at the highest levels. SOE, of course, SIS, the Norwegian High Command, and even to Churchill himself, who has gone on record. I think it's dependent on one of the files, you know, what are we doing for these gallant men? I mean, sorry if that's a paraphrase, but that's the inference. Uh, Haukli and Ronneberg received uh, from the British the Distinguished Service Order, and military crosses and military medals were given to the rest of the team. Now, less than half of the original heroes of Telemark are still alive. Those that have died did so knowing that they helped to return their country to freedom and to prevent a nuclear catastrophe in the heart of Europe. For me, it's been a privilege to meet the survivors and hear their stories at first hand. It's been fascinating too to try and recreate some of what they did using a team of modern commandos from Britain and Norway, the two countries which collaborated so successfully to thwart Hitler's designs. My experience in Scotland and England with the British and Scottish people. And the time I spent in uh, the mountains during the war with my comrades is one of the most important periods of my life. We have come out of the war and the friendships are stronger than they ever were. They tell something that you have chosen the right sorts of people. It's poignant to see these pictures of the two teams, old and new, enjoying a meal together. Within a week of this celebration, Klaus Helberg had passed away. In his 84 years, and despite the best efforts of Hollywood, he never accepted that he was anything other than a patriotic Norwegian doing his duty. All the people living in the towns, housewives, trying to get food for the families. They were there. They were the heavens. We could uh, hide ourselves in the mountains, in the forests. But without the ability of these men, then in their twenties, to survive such an unforgiving place, the war might have been lost. They were the real heroes of Telemark. Their example echoes down to us yet. In my work to teach people about wilderness, I've so often come up against the fact that it's not the skills that are really important, but internal strength. And I think that that's really what's embodied in this story. The Norwegians have a word, ut holdenhet, which loosely translates as endurance. And that's exactly what these young men demonstrated. Their determination to battle on against all odds and to weather the most appalling conditions helped ensure an Allied victory. To me, it's an inspiration and reminds me of how important it is to encourage an adventurous spirit in young people. We hope you've been inspired by the real heroes of Telemark. Next week, search for the answers to a 4,000-year-old mystery in the quest for the lost pharaoh, 8.30 next Wednesday night. 
Coming up, a family of overachievers face life on a tropical island in worlds apart.